Nazareth. Well, hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of La Laughter for All podcast. This is comedian Nazareth, and thank you for joining us on episode number 144. We've been with you since August 19, 2019, people, before the pandemic, and we survived through the pandemic, and now we're back to life, and we're entertaining you. Uh, so thank you for joining us, all you thousands of people that watch us, people on YouTube, people on Twitch, people on LinkedIn, people on uh, uh, Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us. And today you also get the opportunity to ask questions. If you're a, a big uh, race car fan, stunt fan, the engines fan, race engines fan, this is your this is your show. This is your lucky day. Uh, because my good friend Sammy Maloof is going to be with us. But before I bring him on, I just want to remind you people, this Saturday, this Saturday we are having our Laughter for All uh, comedy outreach concert at the Pearson Amphitheater in Anaheim, California. This coming Saturday, the show starts at 7 p.m., uh, I'm going to have comedian Sizzle C with us. I'm going to have Michael Rayner, who's a wonderful variety act. So bring your teens, your kids. And also uh, comedian Gilbert Esquivel is going to be with us. And I'm going to be doing comedy as well. At the end, I'm going to give uh, people the opportunity to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. So if you know any friends, neighbors, loved ones that you need to bring with you, the event is free. It's free to you. It's not free to me. I paid to rent the arena. I paid to, for the comedians. I paid for everything, marketing, advertising, everything with few sponsors who really believe in what we're doing. But so the event is not free. It costs a lot of money, but it's free because we want you to have no excuse to come and laugh. And, you know, you've been stressed out for two years. Your kids have been anxious, depressed, scared. You need to come and laugh and enjoy yourself. But also, you need to care about your neighbors and loved ones who are stressed and fearful and, and don't have the hope that you have. They can come and laugh as well. It's all clean comedy. We're not doing Noah and Adam and Eve jokes. We're doing real comedy. And you can bring them and they pray that at the end of the event, they respond to the message. So this is what we're going to do this coming Saturday. So start inviting friends. Go get your free ticket. It's a free. You got to get it. Online, go to laughterforall.org and click on the event, uh, the Anaheim event, and boom, get your free tickets. We'll see you there. All righty, enough of me. Let's get to the important man that I love. I've known this man for uh, for many, many years. I, I have to say it's been, what do you call it, over 15 years uh, or more. We met at... Uh, uh, you know, the Louis Palau uh, big stadium event in uh, in Texas. And then we did an event, to a racing uh, camp in Oregon. And I love this man. He's from the same. He's Lebanese. He is the Hollywood's number one stuntman, people. Sammy is the star of the Netflix show Drive Hard, The Maloof Way. Sammy's work has been featured in many popular magazines and television shows. He's also Hollywood's number one stuntman with a long list of movies he has been on, such as Mission Impossible, Fast and Furious, Burn Notice, Three Kings, The Hitcher, etc. And he's been featured on the new weekend uh, music video. So, But let me show you what this man does in this little clip. Here you go. How would you like to be remembered at the end of your career? You know something that I don't? <laughs> nah, there's a few things in my life. From engine building to racing. Yes! To stunts. Go, 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 go! But most importantly, when that time does come to transition my shop to my children, I want to make sure the Maloof name will mean something. That's great. So when they're at a racetrack and a racer looks over and sees that it's a Maloof racing engine, they know they best be on their game. He got it. He is Mr. Sam Maloof. Sammy, how are you? 
Man, Nazareth, I am just right. How are you? Thank you so much for taking the time. You're a busy, busy man. You just put this huge event for to raise money for our first responders on September 11th. And I had the honor to be there and people who were there. And, you know, if you didn't see what he brought his stunt friends from Hollywood, people yes. who drive and he put his, his his twin daughters and his other daughter in the middle of the street. And he had his stunt cars going around them within inches of their bodies. You know what? Uh, this man should be arrested as a father, <laughs> but as a stunt man, that was amazing. Uh, you, thank you for doing that. Why do you care about the first responder? You care about these people? Well, <clears throat> first of all, Nazareth, I like to say I love you with all my heart. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope your audience enjoys our, our interview today. But the reason why I like the first responders is because, look, the Bible says, and John 15, 13, no greater love than this, than a man or woman, a person, be willing to lay their life down for others. Our police department, our fire department, our military, the first responders. Look, when we're sleeping home at night and our heads are on the pillow, they're out keeping us safe. And to me, that's worth a lot. And I know that our military, our police departments, our fire departments. In this time, I know that a lot of them, because there are a lot of these are personal friends of mine all over the United States. They've been defunded. But you know what I love about them? They get up every day. This is my heroes in life. And not just the police department, military, but in people in general. This is a hero to me. An individual who gets up every single morning, gets their self or their family ready, goes to work on the way to work, stop, get gas. Somebody comes over there to ask them for a few bucks. They're hungry, whatever. They feed them. They go to work. They bust numbers every day, helping other other employees or other, other colleagues of theirs with their problems, solving their own, on the way home, stop, get food for their family, come home, cook food, spend some time with their family, and then the next day, Get up and do it all over again. Mm -hmm. Those are heroes to me. Those are the ones that, that are consistent and being consistent. You know, let me ask you this. Uh, there's a lot of Lebanese people. Lebanese people were the first people who migrated to the U.S. back in the 1800s and 1900s. But out of all the Lebanese families, the Malou family is the most famous name we know. Tell us a little bit about your heritage, Sammy. Well, <clears throat> Our, our heritage starts in the Middle East in a in a town called Zakhle, Zakhle, Lebanon. You know where it's at. Yes, that's where my family's from. They migrated out here, you know, in the early twenties. They come out here. My my grandfather had grocery stores in L.A. They owned almost half of L.A. And then, of course, my father, when you know, as he was growing up, he was into racing and and building stuff and then he got into you know the house wrecking business then he got drafted actually he had to join in 1941 joined the military he trained mm. with the marine corps in jungle warfare guerrilla warfare then in january of 42 they birthed an outfit called the cbs and mm. he went to guam and okinawa pearl harbor um iwo jima wake island philippines all through the south pacific Mm -hmm. And he was there from 41 to 45. Well, <clears throat> after he gets out, of course, my mom and them get married. And then comes my brother, sister, and I. And, of course, growing up, I was the only one in the house that was a good boy. My sister, <laughs> no, no, my sister was in trouble. My brother was in trouble, but I was the good boy. Trust me. I trust me. The famous <laughs> last words of a knucklehead is when they say, trust me. Okay. So, no, so growing up, you know, I, as a kid, I had a go-kart that did, I don't know, was close to 80 miles an hour in the fourth grade. Then you know, we tried to jump a golf cart over the wash. And my buddy and I, and, and because we lived in San Gabriel next to the golf course, so I told him, let's get the golf cart. I promise we can jump the wash. <laughs> so he said, okay, anything I said, they would say, okay. So we went on the other side of the golf course, I said, you take the golf clubs, throw them off. 
I'll get the golf cart. I'll get in this. I'll get in this driver's seat. So I got. We threw them off. I get in the driver's seat. And the back in there, there was old golf carts. They were um, gasoline carts. So right. you just have to push the pedal to the floor, and it starts it up. <laughs> it starts going right. So we bring it all the way to the other side. I back it up to the fence, and now before it gets to the wash, Nasra, there's a berm, like a little hill. Okay. Uh -huh. I hold on. I, I'm standing up. My foot is on the gas pedal. I'm holding onto the canopy arm, and so is my buddy. Right before it goes over, I tell him, it doesn't look good. And we went, boom, straight boom. down in the wash. And the only thing that really saved us is the canopy. Because <laughs> it, we, we flew off of the thing into the canopy rather than hit the concrete wall. Oh, my so, Lord. So, lo and behold, my folks had to buy a golf cart. So... <laughs> That's where it sort of started. <clears throat> to be a stuntman, not a race car driver. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. I don't know if it was being a stuntman or being just an idiot, but one or the other. So they <laughs> say, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. <laughs> so, so let's see. So you went to school. What do you want to do? Like when you were, you know, when you were young, we said I want to grow up. Did you want it to you be know, a stuntman? Nasher, that is a very powerful question. Because, excuse me, because growing up, <clears throat> when we grew up, our, our family taught us how to think. Mm. The new generation is told what to think. And I, my heart goes out to them. So when we were growing up, my father and mother had a lot of apartments. So we were very fortunate to be able to, back then you don't realize it because your kids and all you want to do is play on go-karts and mini bikes and play with your friends. But we were very fortunate to get up and go do yard work, mm. plumbing, you know, it, it, carpet work, painting on all the rental properties. So growing mm. up, we learned a lot of mechanical skill sets in Nazareth. Right. So unbeknownst to us, my father and mother were training us in how to, how to be mechanically inclined. Mm. So <clears throat> nowadays, my heart goes out to children because they, didn't ha they don't have any more of this wood shop, machine shop, auto shop, drafting. They don't have home economics, electronics. So they're in the schools and all that they have is this. Mm -hmm. Their parents give them a phone as a form of babysitting. But they like to say, well, I want to know where my kid is at all times. Come on, your kid's going to be on that computer, on that phone, on YouTube and TikTok and, and whatever else pops up, you know. So mm -hmm. growing up in our household, we never really had that. So we had to have a discipline. We had to have honor and respect. So there's a lot that I could go into that, Nazareth, you know, and I could pertain it to what's happened in my life today. You know, when we, when we were little, we had to get up every morning, fix our bed, wash our face, brush our teeth, comb our hair, get dressed, go right. to a breakfast table, eat our breakfast, wash our dishes, dry and put them away. When we come home, we wipe our feet, our shoes off in the house. We didn't get to run around in all the house. We ran around in the den, in our rooms, and in the kitchen. We couldn't go in the living room because that's off limits for the company. Right. <laughs> that's so, right. You know, we we didn't. But I, I could tell you as we go on what I just said, how it pertains to you as an adult. Mm. So when did you start, like, your, your dad just said... off. I can't what? hear you. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? No? Huh. I this can't hear you. You cannot hear me. I can hear you perfectly. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I don't know what happened. I think I am I am okay speaking. Let's see. Can you can't hear me? Let's see. Audio. Yeah, we're fine. Can you hear me here? Now I can't hear you. <laughs> this is weird. Thank you, Mr. Restream. I can't hear you now. Huh. That's weird. Let's try this again. Oh, Sammy, I can't do that to you. Okay. 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 Where is... Huh. Can you hear me, Sammy? Hello? No, no, no. Okay. Let me try this. Uh, can you hear me? What is that? Can you... No?
No, we can't hear each other. People, there's 240 people watching, and I, I let me try something else. How about let's do? Uh, okay, here we go. Default. Okay, how about now? Can you hear me? You can hear me now. Okay, I cannot. I still can't hear you, so I don't know what's going on. No, 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 no. Hmm. Sorry, people, for this technical difficulty. We will, will, will continue trying here. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, here you go. Hello. Can you hear me now? No. Drag to move. Yes, you can hear me. Yeah, but I can't. I can't hear you. So, let's try. I don't know what happened, people. We will get this. Do a reboot, reset. Okay. Let me do it. How do I do that, Bobby Miller? Okay. It's on Sammy's end. He froze, and now we can hear him. Okay. Let me do. Can you reboot? Can you restart, Mr. Sammy? Sammy, can you just restart your computer? Because I cannot hear it. Okay. Let's try this again. Okay. Okay, here we go. They're going to reset. I apologize, people. Things happen. We're 144 shows. Sometimes things happen, which is okay. We'll cut that in the audio edit, and then you get to enjoy the, the free. Oh, we lost. 180 people are watching. Don't leave us, people. Don't leave us. We'll be back. We will be back. Here's Mr. Sammy Malouf will join us in two seconds, and hopefully everything will be fine. I think his his phone or his computer froze, and right away after that, it cut off. So, uh, while you do it, uh, again, I want to remind you, people, this, this coming Saturday, we're going to have the Laughter for All podcast. Not the Laughter... <laughs> We're having the Laughter for All podcast. We're going to have the Laughter for All comedy concert. It's free at the Pearson Amphitheater in Anaheim on 401 Lemon Street. Go to laughterforall.org and click on the, you know, the event and you get your free tickets. Just register, get your free tickets. You need to, to get your free tickets online. Just, you know, go and click your tickets and then come to the event. And even if you don't, we can still get you if we don't fill up the 2,100 seats. So that's what's going on. Okay, I'm still waiting for Mr. Malouf to rejoin us. Okay. So in the meantime, uh, if you don't know about Sammy, Sammy is a race car driver. Sammy is a stunt, Hollywood's number one stunt man. And he also have this huge garage. Here we go. Let's see. I think we hey. can. Hear hey, now we can hear you. It's, it's perfect. Forgive me, audience. I don't know what went wrong. No, it's okay. We 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 went from two hundred and forty listeners to one eighty three, but they will come back. So okay. it's light. okay. We'll come back. I'm mean, shut the Let's All right. Take that off and make it big. Sure. Yeah. This. Uh, we, yes. All right. It's so good to have Janine, your uh, Ferdinand, your assistant. Yes. She's Thank amazing. You, Jesus. Thank you. Uh, all right, welcome back. Uh, the, my question to you: When, when you, st when, when, when did you start thinking about doing stunts and, uh, after that golf cart, and how did your mom react to that? <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. Okay. So, Nazra, thank you so much for bringing me back to that question. So, in everything I say today, it's not going to be so much about me as much as as much as it's about your audience, because really, I believe that we can avoid pitfalls in life by not going through an experience, learning from somebody else's experience. So right. growing up, of course, I wanted to be a, a truck driver. I wanted to be a mechanic. I wanted to be a, a stuntman. I wanted to be a, a, a ball player. I wanted all of these things, okay? But okay. you're not sure when you're growing up because sometimes you don't have the wisdom that you do now. So my thing is this. I tell the younger generation now, because this is what God showed me. What can you get up and enjoy doing every single day of your life? Number one, that is what you're supposed to do. If God mm. came to you right now and said, 
Nazareth, if you can do anything in your life to support you and your family and do it every single day of your life for the rest of your life, what would it be? And you would say huh. comedy. That's comedy. what you're supposed to do. You're right. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what you're chosen to do. Number one. Number two, you become the greatest comic comedian in the world because money is only a reward for a problem you solve. I tell people before they go to colleges, look, look before you go get educated, figure out what you want to do. Mm. Otherwise, there's going to be a babysitting institute. Right. Okay. They take out a student loan. Their, their outcome exceeds their income. Their upkeep is a downfall. They work anywhere they can just to pay the interest off. They go to school, they get a piece of paper, finally land the job they went to school for. And then two years later, they're doing a career change. So I try to help them avoid that before they get into the I found out what they can enjoy doing every day. A lot of them say, well, that question was never asked. Okay, well, I'm asking it to you. Well, I'm not mm. sure. Okay, let's think about it before you make decisions. Otherwise, time is one thing you can never get back. Every second, it's like a raindrop going in front of your eyes. You can't get it back. And you don't want right. to try to wind the clock up, put a steering wheel to the hands of the clock, and back up the hands of the clock and wish – that you did something different in your life. You don't want that. You don't want to live that. You want to make sure that you make quality decisions today for tomorrow because the secret to the future is hidden in the daily routine. We can't complain about what we permit. That's gold. That's that's deep, man. I appreciate yeah. that. And I love it that you're able to speak to youth and to other young people about that. That's a, And you're a living example. You know, uh, so I just want to, uh, I want to back up to stunt, doing stunts. When was your first stunt? When were, when, what made you want to do that? Well, <clears throat> I think one of my first stunts was, um, I want to say it might have been either Wonder Years or working on a Linda Carter movie um, or maybe Baywatch. One of those, I can't remember. One of those were first, okay? But when I really uh -huh. started getting into stunts, I worked on a movie called Lady in Waiting. A friend of mine, a coordinator by the name of Gary Littlejohn, got me, passed away now, one of my mentors, Taft Hartley me in SAG as a stuntman. Uh -huh. And then I think I did a, some car driving and I did a fight scene with Michael uh -huh. Nuri, with Michael Nuri in, in a movie called Lady in Waiting. And then I met one of my greatest mentors in our business on a movie called Mighty Joe Young. Uh, uh -huh. I met Terry Leonard. Terry Leonard is a legend, a legend. In fact, you met him the other day at my shop when we had that big stunts and fun event. So yes. that's Terry. You know, Terry's known all over the world. One of his greatest stunts is your audience, I guarantee it's seen in a movie called Romancing the Stone. He doubled oh. Michael Douglas and he went over the waterfall in the Jeep and jumped out. Yeah. He also, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, he was known for the guy that went under the truck with the rope. So Terry is one of my mentors, still is around, and he's still one of the greatest. So I found out that I like fights, balls, and fire, but my specialty, what I'm known for is car stunts, car driving, jumping cars, crashing cars, rolling them, wrecking them, every way imaginable. That's that's when I build them, I race them, and you know that's what I do. You, you know, let me let me tell people: if you have Netflix, go to the first episode and watch it, and watch the scene where um, Sammy goes in an SUV, goes on a pipe, not on a ramp, on a pipe, crashes through a, a bus full of explosions, and right when he's going through it, they just blow up. And he just makes it to the other side. And it's just one of those amazing, amazing, I mean, I'm, I'm so glad you're still alive. But uh, people think you just, you know, oh, I'm a crazy guy. I'm just going to get in car and do stunts. Tell us about the science that goes into that. Uh, you, when you were sharing with me when I was at your garage, tell the audience, what does it take before you do a stunt? What, what you, you, you're a scientist and a mathematician and a physician, a, a physicist when you do that. 
Well, thank you very much. As a stuntman, we're not daredevils. So we try to calculate our stunts. And what makes a great stuntman is, a, is an individual who can repeat the stunt over and over and over again and be safe at it. So the Bible says a man with wisdom sees a problem and avoids it. Mm. Granted, you got some of the greatest people in the world on a movie set. You can never go to a school, college, anywhere in the world and learn more about every part of relationship, work ethics, creativity, exercising your skills and your gifts on any, anywhere other than a movie set. A movie wow. set, you learn so much Nazareth from electrical to grip to special effects to setting. And there's a multitude of wisdom. So if I was to tell you, oh, yeah, I could do this, I, I would sound really good. But you know what? It's a lie. Everybody there collectively keeps you safe. So you learn so much as you go along. Uh, just so happens on on our show, when I crashed that Suburban through the bus, it wasn't in the ideal situation. It wasn't an ideal situation. Think about this. You got what Nazareth says is a pipe. It's a pipe that looks ramp and it's round. And I'm going to take this car and I'm going to take the left tire and put it on the outside of that round and the left rear tire is going to go up it. I'm going to go like this and it's going to turn that car and go straight here. If it's on flat ground, that's the ideal thing. But where they put the bus and what the way I was going to do the stunt, it was in a very unforgiving situation. Mm. I was coming down a hill and the ramp is like this. So if I'm coming down a hill and I'm going to hit the ramp, it's going to try to drive the ramp around versus if it was flat and I came up. So right. I seen where they put me. I seen the road, seen it was all dirt. And for me to hit a ramp and put a truck through a bus, I need to hit it about 60 or 70 miles an hour. Well, I couldn't get that speed. So <clears throat> the ramp was about 22 feet away from the bus. I prayed about it and God had told me, move the ramp up eight foot six from the bus hmm. i did eight foot six now remember i'm a christian i'm not a normal christian i need to hear from god i'm not a <laughs> label if you don't hear from god something's going to happen and most people who are christians they like to blame god rather than themselves i'm not that guy if it's not working for me it ain't god it's me so wow i moved it eight foot six now last year that does not yeah, that does not fix the whole problem. I'm coming down a hill still. So I wanted that front end as high as I can. So I jacked the Jeep, the front of the truck up, and I put a square block mm. between the suspension and the frame to lift the front up higher so I can get up on the ramp a little bit higher. So then I bulldozed the side of the trees down, and we made a straight path. I knew I was only get going about... 48 miles an hour, maybe 50. But I moved the ramp up like God said, so that I'll drag the right rear of the truck. And uh -huh. as I drag the right rear, it's going to hit the bottom of that bus. So it's going to look like a pipe ramp and a cannon roll. So it's, I'm going to floor that thing. When I'm going to get there, I hit it here. It starts going through the bus. Right wheel hits the bottom of the bus. Boom. And it catapults it over rear end over tea kettles that's the only thing that got me through that because if i didn't do it that way i would have got hung up in the bus and my and the explosion door would have been up the passenger would have been down the flames would have went through the bottom and i'm over here at the top there's no exit the flame went on me i had to get it through that bus it just so happened wow. the special effects guys they were paying attention attention to and blew it at the right time so everything worked out good it was, i was very sore after that hit because <laughs> i i got an eight thousand pound suburban 
going through a 30,000 pound bus. And when I hit the bottom, it wants to try to stop. So all the load was on my boom, on my safety belt and on my shoulders. So it was, it took a little bit of a toll on me, but you know what? Again, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. <laughs> now, what's the, what's the hardest or the scariest stunt you've ever done? <laughs> <laughs> Look, Fast Furious 2, the Corvette that flipped over was not supposed to flip. It was a convertible oh. vet. The stunt, we call that a happy accident. We did everything the way we were supposed to. But again, I don't rule out God. And when you're in a bull car, you don't want to wear a harness belt. Because if you're strapped in here, Nazareth, uh -huh. and the car's going to flip, can't go anywhere. So we usually use a lap belt. We put a grab strap on the floor. Because the rule of thumb to me is the car's not going to to crush any lower than the dashboard so oh. you want to try to get under the dashboard so oh now, so if you're in a convertible and a flipping try to get under yeah try to get under the dash but remember there's no roof on top so it's going to be a harder hit i wasn't planning on flipping the car the car flipped it wasn't supposed to flip so we 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 did it's called a chalk talk everything sounds real good on paper Right, Remember, but, <laughs> but working knowledge is different than page. So, so, on the day I didn't rule out God, and God told me what to do: take the harness belts off. Well, He says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let each, each word be established. I prayed about it. God says, "Don't use the harness belts," which I already knew. As as driver, there's no roll cage. We don't put a, we don't restrict the belt. Terry comes over to go, Sammy. I don't want to see you use harness belts. I go, Terry, I got him out of the car. So then the next thing I do, the uh, next thing I hear is Jim Wilkie, the truck driver, goes, Sammy, I brought you a grab strap. There's a camera right here. I can't put the grab strap on the floor. There's a console in the car. There's a camera. So I can't get to the floor anyway. So what do I do? I took and I wrapped my right bicep and I anchored it to the speed rail of the camera. So it's holding me over to the center of the car. The car, the stunt is going to be, as, as we, if you guys watched the movie, they left it in there. In fact, they got nominated for a stunt award in that movie. So as it's going, they released the Mustang off the truck. They already did all the other sequels to it. So now they're going to release the Mustang. It falls off the truck. I'm supposed to hit it. The stunt is at 55, but they released that car. And I get to it, it should be a 25 mile an hour hit on paper. On paper. But when they said, okay, so after I get that part, I go to get in and God says, put your angels around the car. And in Nazareth, 36 years, I've been breath to breath with God. I challenge anybody to come around. And when I pray for people and do difference, I tell an angel, to bring man here, he brings him here. Hold him down, they hold him down. Jesus said in John 14, 12, I live in you the work I do, you will do also and greater. And if the people look around them, they're doing greater work now than when Christ walked the earth. We didn't, God did no buildings with air conditioning. He didn't have right. no toilets in the house. He didn't have no houses, carpet. He didn't have no cars to go, air conditioning. He gives us creative wisdom. That's the God we serve. So <clears throat> I put angels around my car. Nazareth, when they said action, I couldn't see one thing because the special effects on the was blowing white stuff all through the car in my face. Oh, my Lord. So one of the stuntmen were, Terry, we can't see. Sammy can't see. They didn't get that message. The next message I got was, Sammy Maloof, we're doing V5. So I reach over and I flip a camera on. The next thing I'm supposed to hear, Nazareth, is releasing the car from the truck. We don't hear that. I hear the cable cutters go off. Boom! The car drops. I can't see the car because it's so much special effects. So I'm going, where's the car? Well, now look, at they hire you as a stuntman, not a bedwetter. <laughs> you better make
make this thing look good. Or you, or you don't work in a business no more. So right. I felt this when I heard that car fall. I felt this go on. My, my foot on the gas is going down lower. So 55, <sighs> 65, se- I see a corner of the car at 70, and I mash the throttle. Boom, I hit that Mustang, and the car went straight up in the air. Flip crushed to the ground. Not one oh. hair on my head was touched. Hey, the man. Me, the driver's behind me. Corey Eubanks, my best and dearest friends. He's probably one of the best drivers in our business. He's seen it. He turned and he missed the back of the Corvette. Otherwise, if he would have hit it, my head was right there. <sighs> then, then Troy Robinson, same thing, followed him. Paul Lane, in a, you'll see the movie. A big orange charger turns the wheel. You could see it go like this and miss my car. And then everybody out scattered, but not one hair on my head was touched. Amen. Same thing that happened on a movie called Transit in, uh-huh. in um, Wilmington, North Carolina. That was this, probably one of the scariest stunts other than ice road truckers, 11,000 feet up, jackknifing an 18, blowing it over without <laughs> going over the cliff. <laughs> We're over there on that. My buddy, my buddy's gonna cannon a car. A cannon is this. Passenger is a bomb. You're gonna, get going, <laughs> yeah. you're gonna get going so far. You're gonna push a button and the boom. It's gonna blow the car and you up. You and the car get blown up. Well, my buddy Stephen Paterni, great stunt man. Great stunt man. He's inside the car. He's gonna do the cannon. I'm, I'm in the car behind him. One of the lead cars after him. Steven is in the car. The special effects guys were amateurs. So we didn't know. We thought they knew. So Steven has got a button in his hand because he's going to push the button at the time he needs it to blow the car up. So every few seconds, Steven is saying, my hand is off the button. Nazareth, I'm standing next to a car. The special effects guys are making it hot. Next thing you know, they broke the cannon. Ah. It wasn't supposed to blow. All the flames went under the car from the cannon and engulfed me with flames. Blew me in front of the car. I, 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 my bell was rung a little bit. So I'm going, wait a minute, what just happened? I hear people screaming. The special effects guy's on fire. Thank God our stuntmen had fire extinguishers. They went over and they put them out. Steven... Even though he was a safe, he got out of the car quick. I'm looking at people are looking at me. And they're saying, no, you can't be standing. We watched the flames engulf you. God told me this. As Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was in the fiery furnace, he says he was the fireman there, and he was the fireman with me. Amen. Remember, he was 13-8. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, yes. The Lord is the big one. Everything I got today, I'm telling you, it's a rush to walk with God. Amen. Amen. That's amazing. Let me ask you this. People don't know this, but you are you have three daughters. The first one is Hannah, the oldest, who is an excellent engine builder and a mechanic. Yes. I don't know how you got your daughter to do. I can't get my daughters to do the dishes. You got her to become a mechanic like you and me and build the race engines. And then the other the twins, Rachel and uh, Caitlin and Megan. Megan, Caitlin and Megan, yes, are stunt drivers too. Yes. Don't you, aren't you scared for their life? No, no, because I believe that that's a great question. Now that your your questions are phenomenal, because First Timothy, 1, God said, "I did not give you the spirit of fear." So fear is a spirit. Now Nazareth, I have yeah. a reverence of respect for every single stunt, but I don't have fear. Mm. Job said the things he greatly feared has came upon him and what he dreaded happened. He's not at peace, nor is he quiet. Trouble to him. So fear is a spirit, leaves your body, possesses the thing you're afraid of and brings it back. So I train my children to have a reverence of respect for every stunt. And I train them in Lebanese. We call it Asa. 
you know, I think Bithesic all the time. No. So I tell I tell my little ones, I tell my little ones at a young age, because I believe it's easier to have a child than reprogram the adult. Right. So, so I train them young how to respect the tools, how to respect the work, how to be safe, pay attention. A man or woman or a person with wisdom sees the problem and then avoids it. I train him in that. In that. Mm. So I do, I have concerns for my little girls. The concern is this. I don't want my children to have to depend on the race car shop and stunts to put a roof over their head. So I'm mm. training them at a young age how to make their money work for them. Let them to work here because they want to, not because they have to. Mm -hmm. It's different now, Nazareth. It's a different world right now. And, and I know my girls are very zealous and excited and very smart and got a lot of working knowledge, not just knowledge, working knowledge. But still, I try to help divert them into understanding. I want them to have this. I want them to enjoy this. I want for them to respect this, but I don't want them to have to depend on it. Same thing I trained my, my little nephew, Joshua. He's on a TV show. And Joshua's a brilliant young lad. I love him very much. And the, all the children around us, they listen. They respect, they honor, that they want to retain the information. They want to avoid the pitfalls in life, but it's it's taught to them, you know. You, they got to be willing to break habits because that's the only thing in your life that's in charge of your life. God's not in charge of your life. Every otherwise, everything you do would be perfect. You're not even in charge of your life. As old as we are, we know wrong. We're always going to do what is right. So what God showed me was the only thing in charge of our life is our habits. We decide a habit. The habit decides the future. It takes a Amen. second to break the habit, seven days to create a new one. Amen. You know, this I would love, I pray that every father would listen to this, every parent would listen to this. This is, we're talking about stunts, I'm talking about engines, but this is a parenting uh, podcast, people. Yes. How to train your kids, what to do. Uh, you know, people normally in your industry, in Hollywood, in this, you know, they're divorced. They have uh, this, they have that. You've been faithful to Jennifer for 26 years, your wife. And uh, you have three daughters. Have you ever prayed for a boy? You wanted a son? Look, that's a good question. I We've ever on... You know, I have three beautiful daughters. I have twins, Hannah, Caitlin, and Megan are my three daughters. But I, I don't really think of it as I'm missing out on something. You know, when Trevor... No, you're not, because of what they do, because yes, of what they do. Because the honor and respect. Look, there's a lot of children that don't respect their parents. You know, they go to schools and they're taught not to respect their parents. And I try to tell the children, tell you something, your parents are doing the best they possibly can do given the situations, the challenges, or circumstances they're going through. They're doing the best they can. Maybe that's not the best that can be done, but it's the best they can do. So be quiet. Give your mom and dad a break. They're the ones right now that are putting the roof on your head. I tell the kids, you guys don't know how easy you got it because you could have been aborted. They brought you in the world here. Come on. Mm. Give, them, give your parents a break. My, I train the kids around me to be very honorable and respectful. So Trevor grew up in a household that was very divided. And what does the Bible say? A house that's divided is a house that falls. Right. They were into, you know, the parent, he didn't know his real mother. She was into drugs and the father he didn't know about. So they passed them down to the, one of the, the cousins he couldn't take them when she got older because of their liberal ways of raising them that backfired on them. They tried to give them to the grandfather. He said he didn't want them. They're going to send them to the state. Said, take him. They go, if, if he would have took them, 
This is the truth. If you would have took them, they'd have probably been in divorce court. So I couldn't let the kid go to the state because once they're in the state, I believe it's real challenging. So right. and that's my belief system. So I says, we'll take him in. So we brought him in under our wing and we mentored him since he was 13 years old. Look, we didn't get him when he was born. He's got 13 years of bad behavior. So it's going to take a while to get him correct. And, you know, if you don't hold a firm, strong, foundational accountability type ethic, Nazareth, it ain't going to work. They've got, there's got to be consequences. If you do that, this is what's going to happen. Look, you reap what you sow. You don't plant peas to get corn. You plant peas, you get peas. You plant corn, you get corn. You don't plant peas, you get corn. So my thing is, is a consequence to everything. Right, right. Let me ask you this. Oh. Go ahead. No, I mean, I know you train. I mean, I love what Tina Schneider said. Sammy doesn't only train his girls. He trains all he mentors. He has hundreds and thousands of children that he mentors. God bless you for that. And uh, what what people don't know about uh, you uh, is you you can listen to an engine and know exactly what's wrong with it. And uh, now maybe there's people who are not race car drivers or don't know about engines. What is a normal Joe who drives a regular car? <laughs> what kind of advice do you give people like us who don't know know nothing about cars? So before any young lad, young lady gets in the car, let's get schooled a little bit. They should always check the tires. Mm. Make sure your tire pressure. Once a week, check your water, check your oil. It gets you in a in a habit of taking care of your investment, mm. policing the best investment. I, I try to tell them this: once you get in that car, make sure that you keep your car in good order, clean. If you don't take care of, of your investments, who's going to look at you and take you serious? If you're not going to take care of your own self, come on, you won't take care of nobody else's stuff. So I try right. to teach, pay attention. I try to show them small things, how to change the oil, how to change a tire, how to know when something's going on. If you're going down the freeway and you blow a tire, I tell them exactly what to do. They want to hit the brake and turn the wheel. Don't touch the brake. The oh, wait, 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 wait. This is important. Let's see. So if you're driving and a tire blows back or front tire, don't, don't hit matter. the brake? Don't no. touch the brake. Let off the throttle. Let car start doing slowing down by itself. Hit the flashers. Put your blinker. Start going off. Then you can barely tap the brake easy, easy, easy. Because if you hit the brake, the tire that's blown is going to lock up. I don't care if it has anti-lock or not. You hit that when that tire lock, when that tire is blown, it'll lock up and it'll turn the car. So you just want to let off the throttle. That's amazing advice. That I didn't know that. I did not. Here's another one time. Piece of advice. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, one time I went to a mechanic and he fixed my tires, my put brakes, and he left one of his tools inside my my tire. So I was driving seventy miles on the four or five on the six or five in Long Beach, and all of a sudden my tire locks. And, and just uh, the car started moving. And I praise God, like you said, the angels are around. It was yes. so crowded. And all of a sudden, there's no cars behind me. There were cars behind me when this locked. But all of a sudden, there's nothing. So I just moved to the right and stopped. But you're right. I didn't know you don't push the brake. Yeah. Don't, anytime something blows up the car tire, don't hit the brake. Let off first. Let it start slowing down. Let it beat up. It's going to make a lot of noise. Who cares? Don't hit the brake until you're slow enough where you can tap it easy. Pump it. Another thing is this. Right. Yes. Growing up, when we were growing up, they used to have us hold the steering wheel at 10 into position. Right. That's the most dangerous position in the world. There's more fatal accidents in 10 and 2 than in position. Because what happens on the new cars versus the old cars, the steering is so quick. 
So when you grab a steering wheel, a 10 and 2, and you turn it to avoid, it turns too much, you wind up going off and hitting somebody. The best positions, 9 and 3, 4 and 8. 9 and 3, 4 and 8. Wow. Yep. yep. You, you know why it was 10 till 2? That's yes. the time when people rush to the bars to get alcohol yeah, before exactly. the, <laughs> the two. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. Let me ask you this. You've had so many miracles happen in your life. I know in your stunt. And how did you come to Christ, Sammy? Well, <clears throat> I was making my living in illegal street racing, bare knuckle barn fighting. And arm wrestling. So I made a lot of money. I made two to five grand a week in street racing, my 68 Camaro Z28 and my 64 Chevy pickup. So I made a lot of money doing that. Then we started what they call a flying five. You would get five cars behind you. They take off first. When they get to you, you take off for 5,000 bucks. So they got a running start. That's a company called the flying five so then the mexican folks i got in friends with them and they hired me to go race for them in mexico a place called mitchell con i raced in sacatecas a patsen con Adi, chihuahua but the the real races started where the where the dangerous part was was mitchell con and upson con where people, I got videos with AK-47s, people getting capped when we're drag racing on a street with people on each side. So I built the cars for the Mexican people. They would give me $5 and a plane ticket. And I would go race for them and make them money. Well, one day God, on the way to a race in Canoga Park, I mean, yeah, Canoga Park at a place called Kevin's Burgers. Mm -hmm. On the way out there, God told me if I quit street racing, he would give me a race car. That night, I realized who my friends were or weren't. The moment I, when I heard God say, obey the laws of the land, and I would do a race car, the moment he said that, I put my car, I said, I'm not racing. Everybody in the parking lot turned against me. They call me every name you could think. You're a chicken. You're this. You've met your, your match. You're a bed buddy. You're a thumbs. I didn't care. I didn't care. I heard from God. Two months later, a race car was given to me. Wow. And I still race that GT1 road racing car to this day. A man who led me to the Lord was a morning DJ by, by the name of Ken Cooper. Hmm. He was the morning DJ for KZLA radio station. I met, I met, I met, okay, I was on, on my way to a place called the Longhorn in Canoga Park again. Uh -huh. I was, I only, I would go out at night to street race, street fight, or arm wrestle. This night, I wanted to go find a street fight in a bar, cowboys, because they don't stop until they drop. So, I go there, I'm, I'm summing up the dance floor to see. And you got to remember, this has got to be crazy to do something like this, especially right. nowadays. So I'm over there and I'm standing next to this pillar inside, chewing some ice. When I went to the bar, there was a table full of girls. I know the girls were giggling and laughing about me, but I didn't care. I wanted to fight tonight. I'm standing there looking at the dance floor to see which cowboy is big boy so I can, you know, fight for some money. Just for a fight or to make money? Just a fist fight, money. Money, thousand bucks, five hundred bucks. So how, how do you go tell a guy I beat you up? If I beat you up, I get five hundred? Yeah. Well, listen, listen, you want to you wanna throw you want to throw some blows for a few hundred bucks? And the, the cowboys, when they drink, you bet they do. <laughs> so, yeah. And like I said, you know, you know when you're in a fight with a cowboy. I'll tell you right now. So this girl comes up to me before I can get in any fights. She probably saved me from getting hurt that night because 
she comes up to me and she taps me and she goes, hi, how are you? I go, I'm doing just right. How about you? She goes, I'm doing fine. She goes, my name is Patty. I go, how you doing, Patty? I go, how can I help you? She goes, I work for KZLA radio station. I'm the, one of the producers for the morning show. And I would like you to take me to our Christmas dance. So now, you got to remember now, I'm standing there. I go, there's 300 cowboys in this place. And you got one camel jockey. <laughs> and you're going to come to this turban head and ask me to take you to a dance. I says, when you do, I tell you what, I go, ma'am, I have a race car shop in San Diego. My name is Sammy Malou. Now she's beautiful. Her name was Patty Benassi. I go, you sober yourself up. You call. Them. If you can remember my name, and I'm in San Gabriel. If you can remember my name, call me up and we'll go, we'll go out. So that next morning, she calls my mom's house because I didn't give her my number. <laughs> she said, I have a race car shop in San Gabriel. And my mom answers and she goes, hello. And she's all, my name is Patty. Um, is Sammy Maloof there? She goes, no, he's not here. That's my son. But um, she goes, if you'd like to get a hold of him, let me give you his phone number. So she gave her my shop number. Patty calls me up, comes out. We go to the beach. We ride bikes. We have a great day. And then she wants me to go take her to the Christmas dance, which was fine. I am the guy who led Tim me to Cooper. the Lord, Ken Cooper. Wow. A spirit filled, born again, tongue talking, faith walking Christian. Amen. He mentored me, Nazareth. The, the greatest person that could ever lead me to the Lord was Ken Cooper. Wow. Wow. Praise God. I didn't learn the, I didn't learn the weak water down. I didn't learn blaming God for everything. I learned that all things are full to those who believe. Signs and wonders will follow the believer. Nazareth, I've got hundreds of testimonies. I could tell your show hundreds of of them supernatural i'm not talking mm -hmm. about i needed a dollar and a guy came by and gave me a dollar that's a great testimony when you don't have a dollar i'm talking about being translated through vehicles i'm talking about i'm talking about legs that grow out 13 months of breast cancer leaving i'm talking about supernatural god in all areas god showed me a long time ago if it's important to you and it's that big, it's important to God. If it's important Amen. to you, it's as big as this building, it's important to God. God wants you to have every one of your heart's desires. He wants you to love not the provision. Love the creator, not the creation. Amen. Uh, let me ask you two questions. Well, three questions because we've already, man, I can, I can talk to you forever and I would love to have you back on the show if you would willing. But uh, what is, uh, what do you call it? Number one, uh, the Netflix show. How can people watch it? Where can, what can they do? When's the next season coming up? I know the first eight episodes were out. Um, I know. Go ahead. The, 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 our Netflix show which is and i want to say thank you to netflix and thank you to mac pictures for believing in the maloof family enough to allow us give us a platform so we could exercise our gifts our talents our wisdom across the whole world so um you can go to netflix drive hard the maloof way so we did eight episodes our first season, and we have not talked to Netflix yet or Mac Pictures about a second season. So, but we're so grateful to them for them mm. to, to think of us enough to right. allow us to go. I mean, we can be arrogant all we want, but let me tell you something. One can't multiply. One can never multiply. I could never be where I was if it wasn't for the people in my life. And I like to be humble before I stumble. You know, because that's the whole thing. You know, humility is a, is a first step to get wisdom. You know, so I humble myself. And so 
grateful for people. We never trivialize the gift of access. Every single thing that we're craving in life is on the other side of a person. One person who likes you takes you from where you are to where you need to be that quick. That's what comes mm -hmm. I tell people, don't claw your way to the top. Qualify yourself. It's not about entitlement. It's qualify. Qualify. You, 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 you don't deserve anything you didn't work for. You don't deserve Amen. what you don't work for. It's just like I tell the young girls, boyfriends don't have the privilege that a wife does. A boyfriend does not have that privilege a wife does. Don't mistake it. I tell my daughters, and just like I would tell all the young girls out there, young boys, listen to your brother Sammy very carefully. If you're not going to spend the rest of your life with an individual, don't get it started. Stop right there. God, look at when two people don't like, it becomes mental abuse. They don't even want to go home to each other. Then it becomes verbal abuse. Then it becomes physical abuse. Mm -hmm. It's a basic disrespect to each other when they don't think alike. When I counsel people before they get married, only one question, Nazareth. Only one, only one, only one. You don't need to go to these therapists and forgive me, there's therapists out there, but you need to ask yourself this question first. If nothing changes in that individual's life, not, not one thing, the way they look, the way they eat, the way they dress, the way they want to raise kids, the way they want to spend money, the way they want to save money, if nothing changes, can you be with that person for the rest of your That's life? A great, that's a great go, question. I have a, a, a guy and a girl, they want to get married, and I ask them, I go, ma'am, this is a yes or no question. Only yes or no. If nothing changes in that man, you be with him for the rest of your life. Well, I believe everything changes. Ma'am, ma'am, ma I didn't ask you what you believe. I said yes or no. Well, that's a loaded mm. question. Everything's changed. Ma'am, yes or no. I really think that, you know, it's very, very okay, ma'am, hold on. I asked the man. If nothing changes, can you be with her? He says, no. I go, that's not your wife. Why do you want to marry her? When two people don't, don't think alike, stop right there. That's true. That's so true. Because the, look at the Bible. Man and a woman leaves her family and join together, it says. Then it says, two shall become one flesh. Look, married marriage religion relationship knowing of god knowing god they can be together they can be joined together but if they're not going to become one they're going to be divided only when god puts two together he says what he, he puts together nobody can take apart amen and i want to tell all the mothers out there and fathers who have been through a divorce guys and women both of you are good the woman and the man are good maybe they're just not good for each other. i've learned a long time ago communication is getting understanding it's not bouncing words if we talk for one hour and we didn't get understanding we didn't communicate if we're not willing look i don't want to hold divorce against anybody guys it's okay Get a ladder, get over it. Divorce is not the important look, look, I hate divorce, and so does God. But he hates strife more. He, he says, wow. where there's envy and strife, there's confusion in every work. The Bible says this, Nazareth. The Bible said in 1 Timothy 2.27, 2, 2, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they're going to generate strife. The 20 verse says, so you can escape the snare of the devil in being taken captive to do his will. When you're in a dis Satan's in the middle of it. 
Amen. So You're right. I try to tell people, don't worry about yesterday. And if you had a divorce, you have children, trust me. Just do what is right. Don't do what you feel. Do what is right. That's it. Amen. You are full of wisdom. And uh, one question, how many tickets have you had in your life, speeding tickets? Now, we have to go from wisdom to non-wisdom. Okay? <laughs> I just you want to develop. So I feel, I feel. <laughs> is it a one way or round trip? Take it one, <laughs> one way to round trip. I don't know which one you're talking about. Um, I've had, I've had my look. I'll say this for all the stuff I've done on the street, I haven't had enough, enough tickets. Okay. <laughs> that's that's that? a great answer. Uh, Sammy. Uh, how can people get a hold of you? There's pastors, leaders, people. There's parenting, uh, pa you know, pastors of marriage. and stuff. We need to get this guy. We need to this guy to come and speak to our group, to speak to our stuff. Uh, so how can people get a hold of you? Also, how can people who want to, to go, hey, man, I have a race car. I need to get, a, you know, a better engine or i i am interested in uh, what sammy does as a stuntman how can they get a hold of you well i'm very easy to get a hold of you can go to sammy mm -hmm. on sammy .com, you'll find my winning at the race of life outreach where i go all over the united states i bring my big truck and my stunt car i speak to churches schools colleges prisons and I put a stunt show on and I give choice. So it's very prosperous for the church because I show the church how to generate a lot of funds through it. And mm. it's very prosperous for the children because God has given me a small amount of wisdom under the anointing of God to deliver to his children so their hearts are open and they realize how much God loves them and how important mm. they are to God. And when you realize how important you are to God, you're going to want to do you can for God's kids. You know, a person asked me one time, they go, really, do you really know the will of God? I go, yes, I do. The will of God is this, Nazareth. God is going to perform his word on this earth through his word. That's his will, to perform his word on this earth through his children. And you know what? God's a good God. He Amen. said every imperfect gift comes from him. If it isn't God, it's no good. Satan's defeated in the pit of hell. God and mm -hmm. Satan do not work together. Satan's not employed by God. People tell me all the time, God's allowing this and God put me through this. Wait, wait, wait. If my children are believing that God, that I'm part of their problem, if my children are believing I'm part of the problem, they will never believe I'm the solution. If right. you're believing in some way, that God is a cause of sickness and disease, and God's putting God's this and God and making God part of the problem. They will never believe that God's the answer. The population is full of people right now who believe that God put them there. Heaven's full of people who left the earth early because they thought God put sickness on them, and God did that to teach them something. God sent them the holy spirit to teach you not sickness amen 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 you are so full of i need to have you back on the show when you when you have time also i would oh, love for you to... i love you man i would love to see you on saturday if you can make it to the to the big amphitheater with your let me know vip seating for you and your family if you want to come yeah, you know saturday um we'll go to the stun awards but i don't know if i'm gonna go to that if I don't go to the Stun Awards, my little girls and stuff, they want to go over there. If they're going to go there, I don't go. I'm going to your place. Just make sure I get the address. And I don't know yeah. if, if, you know, whatever whatever it is, give me the address, and I'll see you over there. Yeah, you got it. I love you, man. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you so Thank much. You. And people, please go to sammaloof.com. Go to the net. If you have Netflix, go to Drive Hard, the Maloof way. And you're going to really, really enjoy that show. I love you, Sammy. Thank you so much for, for being with Nazareth, us. God can bless. I pray for your audience real quick? Yes, please. Of course. Father, in the name of, Father, in the name of Jesus, as Nazareth and I boldly go to the throne of grace, we lift up every listener now. Father, 
I'm thanking you right now that you'll open the windows of heaven. And my brothers are on the other side listening, that they say, I receive. I ask you to open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that they cannot contain. And Father, I'm asking now, as I stand in agreement, that every sickness, disease, poverty spirit, spirit of lack right now be broken and all generational soul ties and curse. Father, you came to redeem us from the curse, sickness, disease, lack, and poverty. I'm asking you now, the people out there who don't know if you're real, I'm asking you to send spirit-filled, born-again, tongue-talking Christians across their path. Prepare their hearts, Father, to receive the message that your children deliver to them under the anointing. I thank you that Nazareth show prospers above and beyond what he can ever think or ask. I think that Nazareth will be gone to the four corners of this world, earth as he's already. And people will realize when Nazareth speaks the anointing that's on him, the joy that comes out of him, the gift that he has, it's not from him, it's from you. Like you said, God, you don't give us good gifts because we're good. You give us gifts because you're good. I'm giving you the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Nazareth, amen. Let me know if I, I didn't get to speak about a lot of the stuff. I want to, stop, but what was spoken was good. And if there's ever a time I can be on your show again, or Any pastors, time. I will be more than happy. I would love to have you back. And our listeners, we had the highest 352 people watching live. I think that's the highest we've ever had. So you know where you stand. So we love you, man. Thank you so much, brother. Thank, All right. Thank you Just so hang much. on. Yes. And thank you guys for watching the show. And I want to remind you again, this Saturday, a eh, September 17, 2022. If you'd like to come to the Pearson Park Amphitheater in Anaheim, 7 p.m. Doors open at 6. Free event. Go to laughterforall.org and get your free ticket. A free ticket for you and your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, anybody you want to bring with you. This Saturday, people, be there early. 6 o'clock, 2100 Cedars. I'm telling you, it's going to be full. So come on. Start uh, inviting your friends. Start praying for your friends who you can bring with you. So we're able to bring them laughter and bring you laughter. And also at the end, they get to respond to the hope in Christ. So we love you guys. Thank you for watching. And you guys have a great night. By the way, next week, Mac Powell from Third Day is going to be my guest. Third Day, Mac Powell. He, you know, you probably know a lot of his worship songs. Mac Powell uh, from Third Day will be on the show. So we'll see you there. And God bless you and have a great night. Thank you.